Good evening. Thank so many people for coming out on a terrible night, and uh, we promise you a great program this evening. I I'm going to ask the World War II veterans that are here. I know we don't have any Eastern Front guys, but I know we got some World War II veterans. Hal, Bud, thank you for coming. I'm going to bow out tonight. Doug Becky is the moderator and taking care of the program, and it's nice to kind of sit down and uh, let, let some of our new experts take over. Usually when we have a Russian Front program, I, I start out by saying uh, uh, a few things to help Americans understand what went on in the East, because most Americans barely even know that there was a war in the, on the Eastern Front. And if you can imagine that the auditorium here is the population of the United States. So often what I'll have is that someone, I'll have someone in the front row stand up about three quarters of the way, not even fully, fully standing up. And I say that represents American battle deaths in, in World War II. And then I'll have at least the first two rows stand up, maybe the first three rows and say that represents Soviet battle deaths in World War II. Um, the vast majority of German casualties took place in the East. And if you can imagine Soviet suffering, if, if, if everything east of the Mississippi River in the United States was in some way damaged in World War II, every bridge, every town, every house, every city, every road, every airport, Everything was damaged in some way. That's what the Soviet Union went through. Versus the United States, which, which suffered a minimal amount of damage at Pearl Harbor. A couple of cars, a couple of buildings. I'm talking about the civilian world now. And, and the Japanese floated some uh, balloon bombs to the west coast and killed a couple of people and started a few fires. There's no comparison, and yet most Americans don't have a clue about what went on in the East. So it's important to study it, and it helps understand Soviet attitudes. So anyway, we're lucky tonight to have our speaker back, Jonathan House. He's a professor emeritus of military history at, at the, the US Army, United States Army Command and General Staff College. He's a leading authority on Soviet military history with an emphasis on World War II and the Soviet influence upon modern operational doctrine. Together with David Glantz, he wrote multiple books on the Red Army operations on the Eastern Front, most notably, When Titans Clashed, How the Red Army Stopped Hitler, which was described upon initial publication in 1995 as belonging on every college library and on the shelves of all World War II historians. The book was reissued in 2015 as in an expanded edition. It was described as the best overview of combat record of the Soviet, of the Red Army in the Second World War. Professor House is a retired colonel of military intelligence. He served as an intelligence analyst for the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon during both the 1991 and 2003 conflicts with Iraq. And he's the author of six books, um, Combined Arms Warfare in the 20th Century, uh, a Military History of the Cold War, 1944 to 62, Towards Combined Arms Warfare, a survey of, survey of the 20th Century Tactics and Doctrine and Organization, Military Intelligence, 1870 to 1991, Controlling Paris, Armed Forces and Counter-Revolution, 1789 to 1848. Um, and his Current book that's the subject of tonight's topic of uh, program, uh, Stalingrad, and co-authored with David Glantz, When Titans Clashed, and The Battle of Kursk, and a four-volume set on the Battle of Stalingrad. This is his fourth visit to the roundtable. I guess I should explain, as I tried to say briefly with the students ahead of time, that um, I am the uh, Boswell to. David Glances Johnson. I am a general historian, as you can tell by the range of different weird topics you heard Doug read off by me. Uh, I am in the business of trying to summarize and explain what David's research is. For those of you not familiar with it, 
David Glantz is a retired colonel of the U.S. Army Field Artillery, um, but he is so recognized that he was elected to the Russian Academy of Sciences because even they recognize that he knows more about the, the Soviet Union and the Soviet Army than they do. And you can't get much higher recommendation than that, I think. Um, and so what we're talking about here is, as Doug said, sort of the, the Reader's Digest version, as I call it, the summary of what is uh, four volumes of accounts, which he painstakingly tried to reconstruct what was going on, as well as a fifth volume of documents. So I always call it the five-volume trilogy. We set out originally to write one book, and then it ended up being, I, f I have no idea, probably over 2,000 pages before then I got asked to go back to the original project. What I want to do tonight is not try to reconstruct the Battle of Stalingrad. We all recognize it as an epic of courage and sacrifice on both sides, and it certainly was. What I want to do is a both simpler and more complex task, which is to try to give you an overview about how it was that the German army lost and the Red Army won. To do that, we need to go back to the end of the first cycle of operations. You know, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union on 22nd of June, 1941. Yeah, six months later, in December of 41, uh, the, the Soviets counterattacked. By the end of January 1942, both sides are just strung out and incredibly overextended. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, there were 16 Panzer divisions, that is armored divisions, on the Eastern Front. But on the 1st of February 1942, those 16 divisions between them had 140 operational tanks, enough for one of the divisions. Uh, you can't get much worse than that. So both sides are engaged in frantically trying to rearm and re-equip and get ready for the next round in the springtime. And I suspect that subconsciously each side thought that the other guy would be just as weak as he was in January while they were going to get strong again. I know that's irrational, but that's the only way I can explain to you some of the things that they then tried to do. The Soviet Union, as you perhaps know, had shipped 500 major factories east of the Ural Mountains in 41 to keep them out of German hands, and now they start to produce a flood of new equipment. With that equipment, the Soviets not only re-equip their shattered divisions, they start to create new and more complex organizations. Specifically in 41, about the only thing they did in the way of armor was to form tank brigades to support the infantry. 50 or 60 tanks, a couple of mechanics, a commander sent them out. Uh, but now, in 42, because they have the ability and the time to do it, they are creating the next higher level of complexity. Uh, they called them corps. We would call them divisions, and rather small divisions at that. Somewhere in the order of 8,000 to 10,000 men. Instead of 50 tanks, you're talking about 150 tanks, roughly. There are various tables of organization we no need to bore ourselves with. There were ultimately, in the course of 1942, 28 tank corps, which as the name implies, is armor heavy. They had tanks, they had field artillery, they had a certain number of engineers uh, and a certain number of infantry, but mostly tanks. There were also eight slightly larger mechanized corps, which again still have tanks and artillery and all other stuff, but they have a much larger balance, a majority, if you will, of truck-mounted infantry. And this is their effort to try and compete with a, a, a German... Uh, Panzer Division or Motorized Division. Um, but in order to do that, that means, by the way, something I'm going to harp on over and over again, that the Soviets, in most cases, took a successful brigade commander and promoted him to the next higher level of complexity. And I'm, whatever your career is in your life, I'm sure you've had this experience that when you get promoted to the next higher level, there's a learning curve involved, isn't there? that you're not going to get everything right the first time. And so part of the story of 1942 is the Red Army learning the hard way. In 1941, they learned just how to stay alive. Now they have to learn how to actually conduct coordinated combined arms operations uh, on a more sophisticated scale. And sometimes they manage it, and sometimes they don't. They're still better off than the Germans, though, because the Germans simply cannot replace their losses of World War, uh, 1941. Um, about the, finally, what the Germans decided to do was to prioritize their shortages. 
You may recall that when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, there were three army groups, that is, groups of armies. Army Group North up by Leningrad, Army, army Group Center, centered on Moscow, Army Group South, it's pretty much the southern half of the front. Well, all right, now they decided that they would give priority to Army Group South, and when you see the plan, you'll understand why they wanted to do that for 42. And consequently, therefore, the divisions in Army Group South got to, mm, let's say, 85% strength. Not perfect, but a lot better than they'd been doing in the wintertime. But in order to do that, then, they have to actually reduce the strength of the rest of the German army in the east. And so the typical infantry division on the eastern front in Army Group Center or north was reduced from nine infantry battalions of, let's say, 500 to 700 men each, down to six. Artillery batteries reduced from four guns to three. Uh, instead of having reconnaissance cars, we're going to have bicycle-mounted troops to go do our scouting for us. There are all kinds of rather extreme uh, measures of conservation, of economy of force, so they can be able to do something down in the south. When you get done with this process, you can sort of look at the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. The Germans, let's face it, still have the experience advantage. Because in most instances, Paulus is an exception, by the way, but in most instances, the Germans in 1942 are commanding at the same level they did in 1941. And most of their staff officers had been in the same position in 1941. So they know what they're doing. It's not that they don't make mistakes. I'll point out one or two mistakes they do make. But that they're basically, they know, you know, this is, we're going to try again. Not true, as I've said, for the Soviets, who have to learn because they've all been promoted upwards. Uh, and that's a major issue. The Germans were able to achieve, which I find astonishing, operational surprise. I mean, okay, they surprised them in June 1941, but fool me once, fool me twice, you know what I mean? How did they do this the second time? The Germans had a very sophisticated deception plan called Operation Kreml, or Kremlin, which was designed to convince the Soviet leadership that the objective of 1942 was to capture Moscow which it wasn't at all, at all true. And it was fairly successful. It kept a large number of Soviet troops up around Moscow for a long time when they should have been elsewhere. And we'll talk about where they should have been in a while. The Soviets have an enormous power. It is much more of a real totalitarian regime than Germany ever was. Or maybe it's just more efficient at being a totalitarian regime. Take your pick. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Soviets have this centralized control not only in the state, which allows them to do things like pack up whole factories and ship them over the Urals. Imagine trying to do that in Tennessee. Uh, but also in terms of the military command. And the wartime headquarters is, is, the, the, is always referred to as the Stavka. Think of it as general headquarters. Presided over by, of course, Joseph Stalin, but also by his senior generals. And they are very much into very strong centralized control. As I tried to say in a, our earlier session, for those of you who were there, uh, Stalin felt that he almost won the war. And we have to give him credit for managing his very slim assets effectively in 41 to stop the Germans in time. So inevitably, when you're losing, it's very hard to allow your subordinates to make mistakes, isn't it? And so they have very tight control. In the course of 1942, he relaxes that control. He gets greater uh, confidence and trust in his subordinates. But initially, and indeed for most of the year, you're going to find the Stavka is micromanaging the field commands, and often the Stavka makes a bad situation a lot worse for the commanders out there. As we said, the Soviets have a lot of new equipment, not everything you need, but a lot. And they probably still have about six million trained reservists that they haven't even mobilized yet. Whereas the German, Germans, for reasons that I don't want to get us off, if you want, we can talk about it in discussion question, but the Germans have absolutely no reservists trained. Everybody who has ever worn the uniform is on active duty, pretty much. Um, and so uh, the Germans then have to find another source of manpower. And what's that source going to be? It has to be their allies, right? The best allies that the Germans have available are the Finnish army, 
But Finland is only in the war to regain the land that it had lost from uh, the Soviet Union in the Winter War of 1939-40. So in 1941, the Finnish army advances to their old frontier, stops and digs in. That's as far as they're going for the next three years. Um, so then there has to be intense diplomatic pressure by Germany on all of their allies and satellites and whatever else. And they scrape a remarkable thing. It's not on this slide, but eventually they persuade their allies to cough up 52 divisions of troops for the new campaign. And as you can see, even in the south, where the main attack's going to be, almost one quarter of the troops available are not Germans. They are uh, uh, Axis, satellite, whatever you want to call them, troops. Now, there are problems there, obviously, because of motivation. But I think that we do these troops a disservice because there is some, a myth out there that somehow or other these troops were uh, incompetent or stupid or cowardly or something like that. Uh, at one point, the, the Germans, when the fronts were quiet, the Germans used to yell across the front line uh, to their, the Soviet counterparts, their, their Russian counterparts specifically, and say, hey, you want to trade an Uzbek for a Romanian? even though the Romanians were taking a higher proportion of casualties than the Germans were. I think the real issue here, the main issue, is that these Allied tr troops don't have the equipment to fight this kind of war. If Germany can't re-equip itself, what are the odds they've done a good job about equipping their allies? Wrong answer, right? It's just common sense. That, um, that picture down the right-hand corner of your screen that is the standard tank found in the 1st Romanian Armored Division and also in any Hungarian armored formations you know, might come across in World War II. It's called the R01. It is literally a kit built from pieces. It's designed based on uh, the Czech T-38 tank. It's obsolescent, very thin armor, very small gun. The Germans wouldn't have used them anymore, but that's primarily what the Romanians and the other allies have to use for. Or take the Italian army. Mussolini, of course, was put on his medal. You always can appeal to his pride, and he'll do something, right? And he increased Italy's contribution on the east from 50,000 to 190,000 between 41 and 42. Problem is, they don't have the equipment to go with it. To provide anti-aircraft -air, anti guns for this new German, Italian field army, they had to take the air defense guns away from Rome, the capital of Italy. Okay? Does that give you an idea of how desperate these guys are? And they have no trucks. If you are an Italian troop, and they, uh, there's, there's been some histories written in the Italians' memoirs that confirm this, that you go to the end of the railroad line, and you get off, and you start walking. And it may be, I don't know, 200 miles before you get to the front. Uh, this can be a real handicap. So what I'm suggesting to you is, regardless of how good or bad these troops were, they were not capable of fighting in the front line, and yet they had to. Um, they were perfectly good for light weapons infantry, for, for rear area security, as you might say, to try and chase down the partisans, the resistance in the rear. But if one of these units comes into contact with one of these new Russian tank corps, forget it. It's, it's a suicide. They have no anti-tank weapons that will penetrate a T-34. All, very little, few, little uh, in the way of any tank mines or barrier materials or anything like that. So they've got a real problem on their hands, right? There are three operations that are preliminaries that occur in May and June. I want to take no more than five minutes, but, but we need to sort of mention them for you to put things in context and explain why it is that they started so late for the, before we even get to the Stalingrad campaign. The first of these, and there are two, basically two uh, German up attacks and one Soviet attack, and all three of them turn out badly, spoiler alert, for the Soviets. Okay? Um, the first one is in the Kursk Peninsula. If you don't recognize this amoeba-shaped thing in the middle of the, the screen there, that's the eastern end of the Crimean Peninsula. Okay? And crammed in there are over 200,000 Red Army soldiers and three field armies with tanks and artillery and all the goodies. Uh, opposite them is the, the German 8th Army, I hes 11th Army. I, he I hesitate to say German 11th Army because there's more Romanians in it than there are Germans. 
It's, it's commanded by uh, uh, Erich von Manstein, who's going to appear over and over again. And Manstein is a great general, and I don't want to belittle him. We could talk about how he did, conducted his maneuver warfare in this case. But the real reason that the Soviets are defeated in the Kursh Peninsula is this man, the photograph in the lower right-hand corner, Lev Meklis. Um, the Soviets have developed a technique uh, by which for, to help the Stavka supervise their subordinates. And it's called a representative of the Stavka, someone whom Stalin and his other his senior commanders trust is sent down locally to keep an eye on these guys to make sure they don't do anything stupid. And most of the time that works because there are people like Vasilyevsky, the chief of staff, or Zhukov, the deputy commander in chief. But in this case, they made a mistake. They sent Lev Meklis, who is a political officer, a commissar. His whole reputation is based on his ability uh, to be ruthless. That when in 1941, when a Soviet unit was defeated, Meklis would show up with a firing squad and shoot the commander. No questions asked. As I, as I said, there is no, there's no, no logical explanation. They won't accept the idea that the other guy had more tanks or anything like that. You're, you're, you, lo you lost, you die. And he uses the same tactics now that he's supposed to be a representative of the Stavka. He rearranges uh, the staffs. He appoints one of his own staff guys to replace the chief of staff of the operation. Generally terrifies and mucks up the entire Soviet defense. And that's before Manstein attacks. And you can see what happens as a result in the space of about a week. Uh, the Germans and Romanians completely overrun uh, the Kirsch Peninsula uh, to the tune of about 190,000 Red Army soldiers killed or captured. The second, having cleaned up the eastern end of Crimea, then uh, Erich von Manstein, commander of 11th Army, cleans up the western end. He attacks the fortified naval base at Sevastopol. And uh, which, this is, if you may recall, this is the area that they fought over in the Crimean War 80 some years previously. And it has fortifications both 19th century and 20th century. It's very thoroughly dug in. Monstein does not have a lot of troops, but what he does have is uh, he's got, first of all, priority on dive bombers for a couple of weeks. And secondly, he has the very small number of German siege guns. In both world wars, if you ever noticed, the Germans are fascinated with big guns. I guess it's sort of like measuring nuclear buttons or something. But, uh, uh, but in all seriousness, they, have, uh, they make available to, to Manstein a 360 millimeter railway gun. I mean, that's, that's a battleship. That's 14 inches, okay, and the, uh, measuring across the back of the shell. So it's, we're used to those out at sea in a battleship, but on a railway car throwing shells at a fortress? Fortress, this is incredible. And so this combination of firepower and, again, some fairly intelligent tactics, you know, doing an amphibious landing right in the middle of downtown, for example. Uh, Monstein, in the course of four weeks, despite desperate Russian resistance, captures Sevastopol, for which he is promoted field marshal as a reward. He becomes Hitler's fair-haired boy, and you know he's going to reappear later in our story. But each of these three operations has cost the, 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 uh, the Soviets, the Army and Navy, total, you know, we're talking probably 700,000 men killed and wounded. And in most cases, because uh, I haven't even got to the third one, in most cases, it's about leadership rather than any failure on their part. The third one is the one major Soviet offensive. Here we have Marshal Semyon Konstantinovich Timoshenko, one of the great heroes of the Russian Civil War two decades before. He's an old uh, Bolshevik, someone that Stalin trusts. Well, maybe he shouldn't have. Because Timoshenko, like every other commander, wants to please his boss. It's especially important to please your boss if you're dealing with a homicidal dictator, right? And so uh, he promised Stalin that he, he could do what Stalin wanted him to do, which was to recapture the city of uh, Kharkov, right there in the left center of the map. Kharkov, um, this by the way is the area that's still being fought over today. This is the Donbass. 
Did you hear very periodically about that the uh, Ukrainians are fighting against the crypto Russians? It's the same area, okay? And it has the same value than is now industrially. Uh, but Kharkov uh, is the objective of the offensive. Timoshenko launches the attack. You can see what he's doing there. He's basically got two pincers reaching out to encircle the city. But remember I told you they're sort of inexperienced. So one staff officer forgets to instruct the two tank corps that are supposed to be the exploitation force to move forward. What they needed to do was every night, so the Germans couldn't see them, sneak forward another 20 miles or so, so they'd be in the right place when it was time for them to attack. Well, somebody forgot to do that, so they're 50 miles behind the lines when they need them. And, and mistakes like that, they happen. They really are. I mean, I sometimes think that people who win battles are the ones who make fewer mistakes. Nobody ever wins a battle by being perfect. I'm sorry. But in this case, um, they can't afford to make mistakes because they're up against the first team. The Germans are surprised initially, but they recover their, uh, their, their nerve and get reorganized. And as you can see by the blue arrows, after about a week, they counterattack and cut off the two pincers that Timoshenko has aimed eastward. And again, as I said, it's another disaster for the Red Army. And all of this happens in May and June, before we even get to the actual offensive, which it's time I got to the, the campaign we're talking about. What are the Germans trying to do here? It's expressed in a Fuhrer order dated the 5th of April, 1942, and uh, basically is drafted between Hitler and his, and his staff officers, so it's a cross between a vague strategic uh, expression and a general <coughs> staff paper. Uh, the first thing we need to recognize about this German plan is it's not about Stalingrad. The whole plan only mentions Stalingrad once, sort of in passing. And what it says, if I can translate it from Germanese into plain English, is it would be desirable, not essential, but desirable, since you're going to be in the neighborhood anyhow, if possible, you should either capture Stalingrad or at least get close enough you can fire artillery shells into it and ruin their whole day, mess them up. And that's the only time Stalingrad's mentioned in the whole plan. Well, okay, if this plan for 42 is not about Stalingrad, what is it about? Bet everybody knows if you think about it. It's about oil. You, I'm, I'm sure many of you are quite aware of the fact that that is Germany's logistical weakness. There are small oil fields in Hungary and Romania, but nowhere near enough fuel to supply this war machine that by 1942, the, uh, the German Navy, when they go to sea, is going to sea with their fuel tanks half empty because they simply can't provide enough diesel and things like this to supply the whole war, war effort. And so where is the oil, the petroleum in the Soviet Union? Way down in the southeastern corner uh, in the Caucasus Mountains, down in the same areas you hear about today. You're going to hear me saying names that should be are really familiar, that are associated with Azerbaijan, where the oil fields are, with uh, Chechnya, which the Russian Federation still doesn't want to let go because it's still full of oil and oil pipelines. It's the same area uh, then as now that's very important uh, economically and politically. And so Hitler is, it may be a dreamer, but he's not a totally unrealistic dreamer. He recognizes that, you know, even if I get there, it's going to be really hard to get a lot of petroleum out of there. He's hoping maybe he can produce enough fuel for the troops locally. But the, his main thought is, I think, even if I can't get too much oil out of there for Germany, I can deny the Soviet Union the use of that fuel. And that in itself will be a big deal. Because the bigger picture here, what's, what Hitler doesn't put down on his uh, anywhere, and so I have to sort of engage in a little bit of uh, tea leave reading, uh, is that he feels that he's running out of time. And he's right. That he believes that he has to finish, knock the, knock the Soviet Union completely out of the war in 42, because if he doesn't, then the, the Soviets, the British, and the Americans will gang up on him in 43 and 44, and it's going to be very, very difficult. And this, you need to stick this in the back of your mind. We have the memoirs of Hitler's generals, all of whom criticize him. We don't have his memoirs, do we? And he is thinking that 
the clock is ticking here. We've got to move, move, move. And so he gets frustrated very easily. Uh, and uh, he's not the only commander in history. You go look at 91, you can find General Schwarzkopf getting frustrated about the rate of advance of the U.S. Army, for example, right? Uh, I could tell you a story about that explains that one, but that's another story. Uh, the point here is that no commander is ever happy with how fast they work. Uh, and, but in this case, Hitler really has caused, cause to want to get them to go. So he's got this plan, Plan Blau, that's to advance southeast into the uh, Caucasus Mountains and to get the oil fields. So why does it fail? First thing we do is just talk about sheer, what did you call it earlier, the tyranny of, of distance? Okay? Look at the straight line distance from where they start at Kharkov to where they want to get, which is Grozny, the, the capital of Chechnya today, by the way, center of oil fields and oil refineries. If the straight line distance is 760 kilometers, roads don't go straight lines. And furthermore, you've got to maneuver against the enemy. So we're probably talking well over 1,000 kilometers, call it 600 or 700 miles, that you're going to have to cover. And it's not just a walk in the park. This is some of the harshest terrain imaginable. Down there southeast of uh, below where it says Don River in Stalingrad, you have this high, arid, very hot semi-desert. And then beyond that, you have the highest mountains in all of Europe, the Caucasus, that you have to get through. Uh, not an easy task. And that's without even factoring in the, so the uh, Red Army that's going to be defending. That's going to be a very, very difficult task. And it's not just that you've got to head for Grozny. You can't just put pedal to the metal and keep going in the best armor tradition, right? But you have to instead think about, while I'm advancing southeast towards the lower right-hand corner on that map, what's a, what are the Soviets going to be doing? They're going to be pounding in on my left flank, and my left flank is going to get longer and longer every day, and we have to find some way to protect that left flank. So the basic conception is twofold. First, we want to destroy the German, the, excuse me, the Red Army as far west as possible. Do a bunch of encirclements like 1941, wipe them off the map, and so if we have less troops to fight against, we can send smaller forces forward and simplify our logistical problem. Uh, but besides doing that, number two is we want to protect our left flank. That means you mostly get line up with the Don River down there south and southeast of Voronezh. Why the Don River? I think it's pretty obvious that that's a nice wide river. It makes a good defensible position. Anybody who wants to come at you is going to have to do an assault river crossing to ver at the very beginning to get at you. So their basic conception is we're going to do a twofold operation. Head for the oil fields with one hand, protect the left flank with the other. And then if on top of that you inadvertently, as they did, blunder into a, a battle at Stalingrad, that's several bridges too far, isn't it? There just aren't enough resources to begin with. But that's in the future. Um, so bear that all in mind as we look at what happens. The German offensive, because of those previous operations, because they've had to take time to re-equip, the German offensive doesn't begin until the 28th of June, 1942. What's wrong with that date? Remember we said that the year before they started on the 22nd, which is the, uh, the summer solstice, uh, the longest day of the year, or another way of putting that is halfway to the next winter. Okay? And now we're going to attack six days later? What's wrong with this picture? But they really didn't have any choice because of their other considerations they had to do again. They kick off their offensive, and for a while, for a couple of weeks, it looks like eh, it's good old days again. The German army is roaring around across the steppe, um, scattering Soviet troops right and left, dive bombers screaming down. Everything looks to be doing great, except there aren't very many prisoners. In 1941, in the first six months of the war, um, the German army and, the, and its allies captured more than three million Red Army soldiers as prisoners. That's not counting the killed, just prisoners, three million. In this whole operation, I don't really, can't really give you an accurate figure. 
I'm not sure anybody's added it up, but it's, it's only more like, say, 80,000. Still a significant number from our point of view, but the, it's, it's not there. They just are not making, taking the kind of prisoners they used to. Why? Because the Soviet commanders are getting better. And so they're learning how to fight. They, they still can't necessarily win, but they're learning how to fight better, and they're able to maneuver against the Germans, and things are just not going the way the Germans wanted them to. And the upshot of this is both of the dictators and their higher headquarters don't understand what's going on at the front, and they both get frustrated. From the point of view of the Stavka, from the point of view of Moscow, it's very simple. Stalin sends out teletypes messages to his field commanders that say things like, I gave you 1,000 tanks, the Germans have 500, why haven't you defeated them? It, it's just not that simple, is it? Uh, but again, if you're a Marxist, that's your approach to things. Let's reduce this to, to statistics and, and hardware, right? Um, and so the Stavka gets impatient. And what does the Stavka do when it's impatient? It hurries the counterattack. You don't have to be a military genius to recognize that warfare is probably the most complex form of human activity. And to make any kind of an attack, you have to take your time and plan and organize things. You have to make sure that your supplies and troops are in the right place, that you have your signal plan set up, that all your subordinates know what they're supposed to do as part of the plan, who's going to attack when, and all those other things, right? And that's going to take, in the best army of possible, a couple of days. But all this time, the Stavka is pounding, we want you to counterattack now, now, now. So what happens? Well, it's the Soviet Union. You're going to attack now, right? And then once you attack, you're not ready. So how successful are you? Not very. But now you're the commander in, the, in a Red Army, and you're losing. Are you going to stop and, and cut your losses? No, that might be... You might not collect your pension that way, let's put it this way, okay? And so they keep going and attacking when they should have basically said oops and started over. And this happens literally probably an average of once every two weeks for four months. It is truly frustrating, and of course the people who pay for this are the Red Army soldiers. Um, Hitler, on the other hand, is equally frustrated and equally doesn't know what is going on. And it's not just Hitler, it's his senior commanders. They can't see that down there where the rubber meets the road, the Red Army is a lot better than it was the year before. From the point of view of Hitler, he expects this to be a replay of 1941. And, and so when he sees his commanders, he doesn't recognize that out there at the tactical level, if you're a German regimental or division or corps commander, you say, you know, to quote Napoleon uh, in 1813, these animals have learned something, right? that you need to think about how, you know, it's not going to be easy. You still think you can win, and indeed, tactically, they could always win, but you have to be more careful. You also have to plan your attacks. You have to protect your, your flanks. You have to have reserves, because if you get overextended, uh, sure as suiting, another couple of those tank corps are going to show up on your left flank uh, and really mess up your plan. So from the point of view of the tactical commanders, they're, mo commanders, they're moving as fast as they can. But from the point of view of Hitler, these guys are being too fussy. They are, quote, letting them get away, unquote, because Hitler thinks it should be just like 1941, and it never is. And the net result is that uh, Hitler gets more and more frustrated, and this is always depicted as Hitler being unrealistic and an amateur, but he's, he's also the man carrying the burden. By the way, I don't want to sound at all sympathetic to Hitler or Stalin. They're both homicidal maniacs, okay? But we have to think ourselves into their shoes, I think, to understand what happened. Any event, on the 13th of July is the first time that Hitler's impatience shows up. By this time, the initial attacks have gone on. Army Group South has reached its initial objectives. <coughs> And they have, as planned, split into two army groups. Army Group A, you can tell by the priority, right, is headed for the oil in the Caucasus. Army Group B is responsible for protecting that left flank. Uh, but Hitler decides on the 13th of July uh, that Field Marshal von Bock, 
who had commanded Army Group South and now commands Army Group B, is just too slow. And Hitler has tried to be reasonable. He's gone out and talked to him and said, you know, I need you to do this. And Bach says, uh-huh. But Bach thinks he's got flexibility, and he doesn't. So he gets fired and replaced by one of his field army commanders, Maximilian Weich, a very competent general who does what nobody's ever heard of, but he does a very good job for the rest of the year. At the same time, Hitler wants to speed things up, make up for lost time. So he reorganizes and reinforces the advance. What does he do? In plain terms, he moves more of his armored forces to Army Group A to head for the oil, because that is the priority, isn't it? OK, well, but what does that mean for Army Group B? You've got your own objectives to take, and you don't have a whole bunch of forces to do it. And this is where we come to our friend uh, Friedrich Paulus. Not fun Paulus, by the way. He is not a nobleman, except, I guess, guilt by association. He married a Romanian countess, so maybe he's, a, he's an honorary nobleman. I don't know. But he's actually a very hardworking middle-class staff officer who, by the way, he is the one exception when I talk about German experience. His last command in the 1930s was a peacetime battalion. And in 1942, he's appointed the commander of a field army because he is probably considered to be the best staff officer in Germany, and so it's time to give him his command. Hmm. May not work right. What's his job? He's part of Army Group B that's supposed to protect that left flank. That means he's advancing to try to secure the Don River. And he is moving into what is called the, uh, the Great Bend of the Don River. If, if I can grossly oversimplify here, the Don River generally runs parallel to the Volga River, let's say 200 kilometers apart. But right here, in the area we're talking about, south, uh, between uh, Voronezh and Stalingrad, the Don River curves eastward, and the Volga River curves westward. And right there on the map in the upper right corner was this Kalik and Stalingrad. The distance between the two is only about 70 kilometers. Call it 40 miles. Um, and that's one reason why Stalingrad's so important, by the way. It is a natural transportation hub for railroads intersecting with the Volga River and making it easier to transship over to the Don River. That's one of the things besides its factories that makes Stalingrad important. Um, so it's, it's Paulus's task to get there. But we've got some problems going. First of all, although the terrain looks nice and open on that map, it's not. There are a lot of uh, small rivers running north-south, sort of perpendicular to his advance. And all those rivers have very high banks. What does that mean? That means that except at the, the existing crossing sites where there are bridges, which could be blown up, but except at the existing crossing sites, uh, the, uh, it's going to be very difficult to cross the river. And that in turn means that Paulus has to do not one, not two, not three, but four deliberate attacks just to get to Stalingrad. Four times he has to stop, collect his supplies, organize his troops, repair his vehicles, do an assault river crossing, and each time he is successful because the German army is still more competent than their counterparts, more experienced, but they'll penetrate a couple dozen uh, miles and then the Soviets stop them again. So he has to do four different assault uh, attacks to, to get to cover 100 kilometers, roughly. And it takes him about six weeks. Finally, on the fourth try, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, he has only one Panzer division, one tank division, and two motorized divisions as far as mechanization is concerned. A motorized division is truck mounted infantry with one battalion of, say, 50 tanks when, on a good day. Okay? Um, and that's all he's got. The rest of his, let's say, his other six or eight divisions are, because it varies over time, are um, leg infantry. And their artillery and their supplies and their wounded are pulled by horses and draft animals like that. So this is not your high-speed, low-drag, high-tech blitzkrieg operation. He simply doesn't have the comp power to, comp power to do it. Uh, the only reason he finally pulled it off the last time is that Hitler realized that Army Group B needed reinforcements. And so on the 30th of July, Hitler had re-re 
prioritize things and shifted uh, the 4th Panzer Army, which despite its name only has one more tank and one more motorized division, uh, the rest of it's again leg infantry, uh, shifted them away from the Caucasus towards Stalingrad. Um, uh, there's an old saying in the army, order, counter, order, disorder. Uh, in other words, that if you keep changing things too many times, somebody's going to screw up. True. Uh, anyhow, in this case, uh, what happens was the Germans made a planning mistake. Well, I always, I'm not bad-mouthing just the Soviets here. In this case, when the Germans re diverted this large formation, uh, they forgot to tell the logisticians to change the shipping priorities. does not take a real military genius to recognize that a mechanized formation takes a lot more fuel and spare parts and ammunition and everything else to make it function than a leg infantry division is, right? And so as a consequence of that, uh, when they are, they're given more resources, or excuse me, they're given more troops but not more resources. And inevitably that means that the whole advance on Stalingrad is running, uh, they're getting about one quarter of the supplies they really needed. Because there's limits to railroads and limits to what Germany has, and the priority is to the other front. Now eventually, uh, the Germans figure out they've screwed up and they correct the mistake. But my point here is, one reason why it takes uh, our friend Paulus so long to get to Stalingrad is he's literally living hand to mouth. He's waiting on the next train to show up or the next couple of trucks or horse-drawn ox cars to show up with enough ammunition and fuel for him to make the attack. And the net result is he doesn't have that much more combat power than his opponents. I skipped over that second bullet there, but I didn't forget about it. Trust me. The 16th Panzer Division, his one tank division, finally breaks through, goes roaring out, and reaches the Volga River just north of the city of Stalingrad. Hooray! But they, almost got, they got cut off and almost destroyed. Because the Red Army's not stupid. They immediately start counterattacking and cut off the 16th Panzer Division. General Hans Huba, the commander of 16th Panzer, has orders to stand there and fight. But he decides, I can't do this. So he calls his subordinate commanders together and says, I'm taking the responsibility to disobey orders. It's not your fault, but I'm going to take the rap because we need to get out of here. And the 16th Panzer almost had to break out and abandon their success until fortunately higher headquarters got enough supplies and fire support in there just in time, like by bombers and so on, to keep them alive. But the fact that it's that close run before they ever get to the city of Stalingrad should tell you this is not the glorious German army advancing majestically across the steppe, is it? This is the Germans and the Soviets being almost even, maybe 55-45, and it's a very, very difficult task for the Germans. We ought to finish the story of the oil in the Caucasus because that, after all, is what the campaign is about before we actually get to Stalingrad itself. Uh, army Group A, remember, is responsible for heading for the oil. And it has a number of field armies under it, like 17th Army and so on. But the real spearhead, the cutting edge, is 1st Panzer Army. You see there in the lower right-hand corner of the map. And 1st Panzer Army on paper has a really impressive number of units. It has three Panzer divisions, three armored divisions, and four large, fat, high-priority motorized divisions. And again, as a motorized division is infantry heavy, but it's still got tanks and all the other bells and whistles. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about the Großdeutschland Division and 5th SS Viking Division. And so obviously, these are some really high-quality troops. But again, they're operating at the end of a long, long logistical uh, chain across very difficult terrain. And so they have, they've rapidly find themselves in the same position as Paulus. They have to stop, repair the tanks, build up the supplies, attack again. The Red Army eventually stops them, and then they got to do it over and over and over again. And you see that uh, they do get to the northernmost oil field, a place called Makeup, um, that's down there where it says 10 August, because that's the date to remind me of it. Um, and at Makeup, uh, it, they, it looks like Kuwait in 1991. If you remember the pictures of all the oil wells burning, the Soviets obviously are not going to turn these over in good condition to the new occupants. 
And so uh, the, the Germans have to spend several months, and they do, let's give them credit, repairing and redrilling and all this other stuff to get the oil out of the ground. And they do finally succeed it, but by that time it's November or December, and as we're going to see, they have to retreat out of there pretty quickly. So that's as close as they got to the oil. Meanwhile, you can see that squiggly line that goes through the words 10 August. That's about as far as our friends in the German army ever got. Because, big surprise, just as it's snowing around here, it starts snowing in the mountains down there about the middle of September. And the Germans do not know where they're going. Their maps are 40 years old. They have to send out light planes looking for the roads to find out which, where to go next. Uh, it's very, very difficult, and they move very, very slowly. And what do you suppose Hitler thinks about that? Mm, expletive deleted even in German. German. Hitler, remember, has to worry about the entire war. Again, his, his generals in their memoirs, they're, they got, they're focused on what's happening right in front of them. They don't recognize that he has to worry in the West because... Which is closer to getting to Moscow, uh, Normandy or Moscow? Excuse me, closer to getting to, to Berlin, Normandy in the west or Moscow in the east? If the Allies ever get ashore in the west, it is really going to be difficult for Germany. And you may recall their little operation in August of 1942 called Dieppe, where the Canadians got sent by the British. Let's not enter that one. Uh, I, I think Princess Patricia's Light Infantry has never forgiven the British for that one. Uh, and they do an amphibious landing at the uh, fortified French port of Dieppe. And it, they're defeated. But boy, does that get Hitler's attention. And you have to recognize that he's got a reason to be concerned. So he starts pulling units out of the east and shipping them westward. And that's further going to weaken his attack. Net result is Hitler's un understandably impatient. On the 9th of September, he's already relieved one commander of Army Group B. Now he relieves the commander of Army Group A, Field Marshal von Liszt, down there in the lower left. And for a couple of months, he doesn't even appoint a new commander. On paper, he's the commander of Army Group A. And all he does is to actually talk, talk um, every day by teletype to the commanders of the field armies and the chief of staff of the Army Group who are down there. Uh, and you may say that's micromanagement, and I cannot disagree but again, from his point of view, the commanders have simply failed him. What else is he going to do? Two weeks later, he gets really impatient, and he fires Halder. Franz Halder is the chief of the German general staff. He has, for the last four years, loyally done whatever Hitler wanted him to do, given Hitler honest advice. But by this point, Hitler decides that he's become too pessimistic, and maybe he's right. That's a very high-priority, high-stress environment. So he fires Halder and places him with a younger, more gung-ho chief of the general staff, Kurt Zeitzler. But Zeitzler, while he may be gung-ho, is not a fool. He is a German general staff officer. Eventually, in fact, he pulls Hitler aside, aside and very politely gives him the explanation I gave you earlier about, hey, we're trying to go to the oil field, we're trying to protect our left flank, and now we're going to get Stalingrad, and mm, we've got a problem here, boss. And Hitler did not explode at him. You know, you always have this image of Hitler's always spitting at his subordinates. No, he was very, very calm and recognized that, yes, I understand what you're saying. There is a problem here. But uh, he decided that Zeitzer was being a little bit downhearted and needed to be motivated. He says, yeah, I understand this problem. We'll get through it. Buck up. Keep going. And that's about all that happens to him. Uh, let's finish the story of the oil so we can finally get to Frag and Stalingrad, right? Uh, but, uh, and it happens in a place, and forgive me those of you who speak Russian, I'm probably going to mangle this. Down the lower right-hand corner there, the unpronounceable name of Orjanakidze. There are actually two towns of this name in the Russian Federation, but this is the, the eastern one. The other, the other one, I think, is in Ukraine somewhere. But uh, at Orjanakidze is a point 115 road miles away from Grozny. Remember where the, all the, the uh, refineries are? It is within striking distance of getting there. And the 23rd Panzer Division gets that far, despite the snow, at the beginning of November. But here's where we come to this man, the, the picture here you've probably never heard of before, Ivan Vladimirovich Chulinev, who is the totally forgettable commander of the Transcaucasus Front 
A front, if you're not familiar, is a, is a Soviet field army, a collection of different armies. It's the next higher headquarters. Chuanef does not have a lot of nice troops supplied to him by uh, Moscow. He has to pretty much, at this point, because he's cut off by Moscow, there's Germans between him and the rest of the country. So he pretty much has to, uh, his only solution is, okay, I'm going to call up the local reservists, form them into a unit, give them a couple of weeks to train together, and send them off to fight. And you can imagine that doesn't work too well. But in this instance, two of these improvised units, the 10th Guards and 11th Guards Rifle Corps, which between them have less than 10,000 troops, managed to encircle the 23rd Panzer Division at the beginning of November. And uh, the commander of 1st Panzer Army, Kleist, does in fact rescue them. He rearranges his troops, breaks through, and enables the soldiers of the 23rd Panzer to escape. However, even the German records reflect that in that week when they were encircled, the, the uh, 23rd Panzer lost 85 of its 119 tanks. So here in this totally forgettable place with this totally forgettable enemy commander is ultimately the failure of the intention of the whole campaign because that's as far as they get. Let us finally, as you say, get on to Stalingrad. The, there are various headquarters in and around Stalingrad, but the principal defense calls to the Red, falls to the Red 62nd Army, commanded by Vasily Ivanovich Chuichkov, who has written his memoirs and therefore become famous to us. Uh, some of his memoirs sound a little bit too uh, heroic to be true, but basically he is, he is a phenomenal commander. He is not a guy who just screams at troops. He cajoles them and stiffens them and builds consensus and does all the things you would want a commander to do. He does not have large amounts of troops. Most of the time he's just basically collecting together a couple hundred guys with a couple of light guns and a, maybe a light tank and using them to plug a hole and slow the Germans down. It's during this period of time when both sides get tunnel vision and get fascinated with Stalingrad in September and October of 42. And to some extent it writes itself. Imagine you are um, working in the Ministry of Propaganda for Goebbels in Germany. And I tell you, we are attacking a city that's been renamed in honor of the Soviet dictator. Can you just see the options, the opportunities of that from the point of view of what we today call information warfare? Okay. Well, can't you at least imply that if you take Stalingrad, you've defeated Stalin? And after a while, I think the, German, the Soviet, I suspect that the Soviet uh, defenders are more concerned about saving, helping their buddies than anything big and highfalutin. But I, after a while, they probably get ornery themselves and say, you know, we're not going to let these exploits deleted take the town. And so both sides just get tunnel visioned in on <clears throat> Stalingrad, even though it really doesn't matter in the big picture of things. Gradually, grindingly, in the course of uh, September, they clear, the Germans clear southern Stalingrad and central Stalingrad. During this time, though, Chuikov is developing his tactics that enable him to be so successful. I like to call them hugging tactics. He didn't invent them. You can find similar tactics used by the, the North Vietnamese in Vietnam in the later 60s. Uh, but basically, it, it's a very simple solution once you think of it. If you're up against somebody, in this case the Germans, who have better fire support than you do, they have more accurate artillery, they have more dive bombers, how do you neutralize their advantage? It says it up there, right? You get as close to them as you can so they don't dare shoot for fear of killing their own people. And so a lot of the battles, of, of, a lot of the time in Stalingrad is fought with one block between the two sides or one road between the two sides. Sometimes I think one wall between the two sides in a building. Makes for very little sleep, as you can imagine. And this is the era that's been uh, uh, you know, made uh, romanticized of, of snipers on both sides, and it certainly did happen. By the way, uh, some of you have heard of Zaitsev, the... Uh, sniper who got the uh, incredible number of kills and was get made a hero of the Soviet Union. Uh, David Glantz found this, a Captain Zaitsev, seems to be the same guy in 1945, who got another Medal of Honor, uh, hero of, of the Soviet Union for a salt river crossing down in Romania. So the guy is just one of those people who has no fear. They're probably not healthy to be around because the rest of us tend to get hurt when you have a commander like that, right? 
But in any event, uh, they're fighting this inch by inch at great cost, and both sides are bleeding out. Um, in the course of about five weeks, I don't know if you can read this, but you can get the idea, uh, just by that adds up to about nine divisions worth of troops that are fed into Chuikov to keep him going. It's not easy to do this, however, I must tell you, because in order to get them to Chuikov, they have to go across the Don River. First of all, not the, the, the Red Navy doesn't have uh, boats big enough to move like T-34 tanks or anything like that. And secondly, the Germans are spent all their time shooting at them, trying to interdict them. And so a lot of stuff just never gets there or gets there with great difficulty. Has to be infiltrated at night. Uh, but over the course of, as I said, of about, about, let's say, five weeks there, in September, October, we're talking probably 100,000 soldiers are sent to reinforce Chuikov, who started out with about 50,000. But as far as I can tell, at no time in the battle did he ever have more than 54,000 troops actually in Stalingrad with him. That's the ferocious level of casualties. And if we're having casualties like that on the Red Army side, what are the Germans doing? Do they have any reinforcements or replacements? No. All they can hope for is a few guys who are lightly wounded recover, come back to duty. Um, for a while, our, uh, and the, the German commanders do what they can. They're not stupid. Uh, our friend uh, Paulus rotates troops. Take, if a unit's been in the fighting in the city for too long, he sends them out to the, the countryside and, and swaps out another unit for a while. But eventually even that doesn't work. So... Uh, uh, Vikes, who is his next higher commander, the Army Group B commander, scrapes together five combat engineer battalions, call it maybe 3,000 troops, guys who are supposed to be able to fight his infantry and also know about explosives, and puts them in as the last sort of gasp to reinforce the German advance, because the Germans are just plain flat out of troops. Give you one figure, don't like to give lots of figures because we've got a lot of cover here and I'm doing my fast as I can, but the 24th Panzer Division, which is the only new Panzer division in the East in 42. It had been a horse cavalry division the year before, and it was converted to tanks. Uh, the 24th Panzer Division starts the campaign in, in summer of 42 with probably close to full strength. Let's call it 14,000 soldiers. But amongst those 14,000 soldiers, there are guys who drive tanks, there are artillerymen, there are mechanics, there are medics, and cooks, exactly. They're, they, have whole, they have bakery companies in the German army. Okay? That's my kind of an army. But, uh, the, uh, but that means that out of those 14,000 troops, maybe 4,000 are what you call dismounts. Guys who can get down out of a vehicle with a weapon and go into a building and clear it. And that's what it's about in Stalingrad. They start with 4,000 by Halloween, by the 31st of October, when they fall out for yet another assault on the factories in northern uh, Stalingrad, the 24th Panzer Division is down to 1,001 officers and men as dismount troops. They've lost three quarters. And that's pretty typical of what happens here. Okay. Meanwhile, the Red Army is giving Chuikov these troops. There's a lot of argument about whether they're giving him everything they could or giving him just enough to keep him alive. That's debatable either way. But what they're doing, meanwhile, is conducting all kinds of counterattacks on the flanks of, you know, here's Sixth Army in Germany, in Stalingrad itself, and the Soviets are making all kinds of counterattacks through here and down through here, trying to take the pressure off of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 62nd Army inside. The Soviets, I should, I probably misspoke. The Soviets are counterattacking against the Germans all the way through here. Um, and they're having no success because remember what I said about the impatience of higher headquarters? And over and over and over again, Red Army soldiers are being told to attack and they're just getting slaughtered. Um, meanwhile, this means though the Germans are just playing out of troops. They need troops in the, in the Caucasus to take the oil fields. They need troops in Stalingrad. So this is where all those Axis satellite troops show up to replace them. From a, a air, for a stretch of about 360 kilometers between the city of Voronezh up off the map and Stalingrad, 
you have three different uh, Axis satellite armies, the second Hungarian, eighth Italian, and third Romanian. And then if you continue on south of the city of Stalingrad, Stalingrad they're in the process of forming another Romanian army, fourth Romanian, down there to the south. Each of these armies has a few German divisions and a few anti-tank detachments in there for reinforcement. But basically, they are dismounted horse cavalry, inf light weapons infantry, out there on the steppe in the snow without any barrier materials. In some cases, the, the front is so convoluted they don't even have the river between them and the, and the Soviets. And they're just hanging out literally in the wind. Uh, and the commander of 3rd Romanian Army is not a fool. He understands this. He keeps saying to the, the German Army Group B, his next higher headquarters, we need to give me a little extra combat power. Let me try to straighten up this front and shore up my defenses. And even Hitler recognizes that they should do that. And they start planning to do that, but we're too busy fighting in Stalingrad. We figure the Red Army is worn out. It's winter time. We'll take care of it next year. Just It, put, it goes in the too hard to do category right then. And that, of course, is the problem. This is the background, then. We're finally going to get to the real attack in Stalingrad for Operation Uranus. Marshal Shukov, in his memoirs, claims responsibility or, or that he is the originator of this idea. Unfortunately, there's no indication that he talked to uh, Stalin at the time that the idea first came up. He was out of town fighting on other fronts that we won't talk about. Instead, as far as we can tell, the commander who comes up with the idea is this guy here, um, Andrei Ivanovich Eremenko, which, again, you've probably never heard of unless you're a real expert on this. Uh, he is the commander of the Stalingrad Front, the next higher headquarters above 62nd Army. His political officer is, anybody know? Khrushchev, Khrushchev yes, exactly. Uh, which is one reason why when you get in, when Khrushchev is in char charge, he thinks he knows more than his generals. And, well, maybe he's right. He's certainly been shot at. He said that the only thing, you know, every, and he had to go, by the way, every weekend up to Stalin to report what was happening in Stalingrad. And he said in his memoirs, every Friday I was never so glad as to see Stalingrad in my rearview mirror, and every Sunday I was never so glad as to see the Kremlin in my rearview mirror and go back. Because <laughs> he really has a difficult job. But anyhow, Aramenko and Chushchev are told at the beginning of uh, October time for another counteroffensive. And they say, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. Of course, we will do this. But this is stupid. We're going to waste our troops. And so Aramenko says, look, why don't we think bigger? Instead of attacking uh, on the, against the Germans, who are well fortified and know what they're doing, why don't we go against the Romanians? We know the Romanians don't have a lot of equipment. Why don't we take a bigger piece of the pie, piece of the pie, try to encircle them? And this, he doesn't really come up with a plan all by himself. There's a lot of modifications. There always are. But ultimately, he comes up with this, you know, they come up with this conception of Operation Uranus. And there's two things I want you to recognize. One, they're attacking the weak point of the enemy. And two, for the first time probably in the whole war, they take their time to get ready for an offensive. And Stalin gives them several extensions, uh, moves the whole thing back by ultimately about 10 days so they can do it right. They're still not perfect. Nobody ever is ready for everything. But they finally, for the first time, launch a major offensive. On the 20th of November, uh, let's see here, the southwestern front and the Don front up here counterattack and break through the Romanians headed southward. And then a day later, because it has a shorter distance to go, the Stalingrad front is attacking in the other direction to link up west of Stalingrad and circle the, the German defenders. That's the plan. Again, one of the myths about this is that the Romanians ran away. Now, they didn't. Actually, the Romanians did a remarkable job of standing up and stopping them. A guy, a fantastic general uh, uh, in the Romanian army, who, of course, my name completely escapes me at the moment, so I better stop and look up. Uh, but uh, the, commander, the commander of one of the divisions in the Romanian army uh, recognizes, oh yeah, Mikhail Leskar, that he's got to do something. He pulls together the remnants of about four Romanian divisions, and for four days he desperately holds up the Soviet advance. 
and the local counterattack forces, including the 1st Romanian Armored Division, do their job and further dis disrupt and disorganize the Germans, the Soviets rather. So the Soviet advance is not nearly as nice and neat as it looks on a map. But ultimately they do succeed in encircling Stalingrad. So we finally got to Stalingrad, right? Not going to at this late date, because I want to finish there quickly, try and fight the whole battle. Let me, however, make a few points that are misunderstandings or maybe even misconceptions, myths about it. The first of these is that a lot of critics then and since then have said that the Sixth Army should have broken out as soon as they got encircled. That Paulus was a fool not to just break out and attack westward and escape while he could. A couple problems with that. First of all, Paulus knew perfectly well that if he tried to do that, he would be relieved and Hitler would put somebody else in who would stay. Secondly, Hitler never thought he would lose Stalingrad, that's true, but he also had a reason, and it wasn't just politics, for holding on to Stalingrad. He figured correctly that as long as the German troops were defending in Stalingrad, that the Soviets would have to tie up a lot of soldiers that would otherwise be exploiting into his rear area. Now, he thought that he could rescue them a lot quicker than he could, but he had a reason for what he was doing. Again, you've got to think the way the dictators think. Thirdly, there's a little matter of horses. I don't know if you can even see it back there. See this horse-drawn cart up there? Remember, in most of the German army, as like in most of the Red Army, that's the standard transportation mode. The problem is at the beginning of November, thinking it was winter time and the war was almost over for the year, the Germans had packed up most of their horses, put them on railway cars, and shipped them off so they could rest and get fat for the next season. What's that mean? If, if the Sixth Army now tries to break out, what's going to happen? It's just going to be individual infantrymen wandering around the snow. Can't take any heavy weapons, can't even take their wounded with them. That's great for morale. Um, and so really, it wasn't a practical alternative, to be honest with you. Another misconception is the idea that Hermann Goering, who is nominally Hitler's number two and the commander of the Luftwaffe, amongst many other jobs. He has every job you can imagine, including Forrester of Prussia. But uh, one of his jobs, he's commander of the Luftwaffe, and he has a different uniform for every one, by the way. Uh, but he is supposedly blamed for having promised Hitler to resupply by air. Well, but the truth of the matter is, as far as we can determine, he didn't talk to Hitler for the first 10 days after the Sixth Army was encircled. It wasn't Goering, but rather Goering's professional, general staff trained, chief of staff, Hans Jeschonek, who eventually committed suicide for other reasons, but uh, who, who went to Hitler, because Hitler, he was the guy available to Hitler when it happened. And not knowing how many troops were encircled and not knowing how long the encirclement was likely to last, thinking about what they'd done previous winter with smaller encirclements, he said, yeah, I think we can do that. Now, give you Sonic credit, though. He went off and talked to the local Air Force leaders, came back and said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I, we cannot do this. But Hitler's not the only man in the world who likes to take the, the answer he likes and ignore subsequent comments, right? That's just sort of human nature, again. You can find all kinds of figures about the airlift. Let me just give you a few. It's been estimated it would have taken 300 tons a day of food and fodder for the remaining horses just to feed the 6th Army. It would have taken about 750 tons a day to completely supply them, fuel, ammunition, spare parts, medical, whatever. That in turn, 750 tons a day, meant if you allow for maintenance availability and so on, about 1,050 JU-52s. You're not familiar with it? JU-52 is the standard German uh, twin-engine transport aircraft. They use other aircraft, but mostly it's JU-52s. The entire Luftwaffe has only three-quarters of that number. And they're not all available for Stalingrad. We're, no we're in November 1942. What happened in Northwest Africa in November 1942? Torch. Torch, exactly. Give the man a prize. <laughs> And the Germans are in the, involved in a frantic airlift from Sicily to Tunisia, to Tunisia to bring in troops to stop the British and Americans. So they cannot. 
and they, they lose a lot of very scarce heavy aircraft and gliders and everything else up there. So the Germans simply don't have the airlift to do this. Um, they never got close to the figures they needed. I mentioned 300 tons as a minimum. Only two days in the, in the 70 days roughly of encirclement did they actually uh, get up to 290 tons. Over the course of the 70 days, the average airlift is about 117.6 tons per day. It's not enough by any stretch of the imagination to keep the German encircled forces alive because there's about a quarter million Germans and Romanians and other people inside of Stalingrad. I will say this, though. They evacuated 25,000 Germans, many of them the badly wounded, sometimes a few key commanders and specialists. So there, there's some value to it. But it certainly was, I don't think any Air Force in the world, including the U.S. Army Air Force, could have done this in 1942. And you'll talk about that next, next time when you talk about the airlift, right? Uh, remember that 1948-49 uh, was a very mild winter. Thirdly, Monstein, like Chuikov, wrote his memoirs 10 years later from memory without access to the records. And as I think I've said before, we all remember things the way they wish, we wish they had happened. And in Monstein's case, he rearranges the dates and the events in his mind to blame Hitler and blame Paulus. And yet, he is put in charge by Hitler of Army Group Don that's supposed to save the, the Sixth Army. And yet, never did he actually go to Hitler and say, we have to break out now. He doesn't accept his own responsibility for this part of it. Furthermore, if you read memoirs by people like Monstein, it seems as if they almost made it to save Sixth Army. They have a plan, uh, which it's not a bad plan on theory. Basically, they took two Panzer Corps headquarters. Notice I said headquarters. And then they had to scrape the troops together underneath them. 48th Panzer Corps is operating from west of Stalingrad, attacking eastward. 57th Panzer Corps is operating from south of Stalingrad, attacking northward. The idea was the two of them would converge and get Paulus out of there. But that's the way the Germans tell the story. If you look at what actually happened, 48th Panzer Corps was never able to launch an offensive. Uh, they were, um, uh, the Soviets hit them so hard and so rapidly that they basically just got pushed out. They never did an organized attack. The 57th Panzer Corps, that's what that picture is down the bottom, moving across the snowy fields, uh, did actually launch an attack about, I think, the 6th of December. And for about nine days, they made some progress. They advanced maybe one-third of the distance. There's about 120 kilometers they have to cover. They managed maybe one-third of the distance north towards Stalingrad. And then they run into the 2nd Guards Army, one of the brand-new, highly-equipped Soviet formations that they've built. And the 2nd Guards Army kicks them all the way back to where they began. And in the process, 57th Panzer Corps lost, I think the figures are 120 tanks and, and no, 170 tanks and armored cars, 170 artillery pieces. Uh, so they really had, never had any chance. So it didn't matter whether our friend Monstein tried to break out. There was nobody there to meet him. Despite being shortly, short, short on supplies, the 6th Army is still a very dangerous animal. And Konstantin Rokossovsky, the commander of the Don Front, is very concerned about, believe it or not, this doesn't sound like any Soviet general you've ever heard of, about saving the lives of his soldiers. He is remembered as the gentleman commander, the guy who never swore at people and who tried to do things. We might think of it as the American way, lots of firepower. He massed as much artillery he could rather than asking the troops to do it. Uh, he rotated his troops forward. He let a division attack for two days, then swapped them out, let them come back, get warm in the tents before they have to do it again because it's bitterly cold. Uh, and he's under enormous pressure from the Stavka, from Stalin, to finish the job, knock out the, the Germans. Instead, he took three weeks to capture the city. Uh, on the, uh, starting on the 10th of January, ending on the 1st of February, uh, they capture Paulus himself. The next day, organized resistance stops. But the, to clear out that pocket that never had more than two, a quarter, 250,000 men in it cost the Red Army 1.3 million killed, wounded, frostbite, and other casualties like that. So. What are we supposed to get from all this? First of all, the Germans were trying to do too much. Their, 
trying to get the oil in the Caucasus. They have to protect their left flank. Then they get involved in Stalingrad. Nobody could do this. I might add, by the way, that after this operation the, uh, is over, the Axis satellite troops are so shattered that except for Romania, their governments take them all home. And Germany is not able to have those troops available. So not only do they lose six army, they lose the equivalent of three other armies as well. Uh, the balance of combat power between the two sides is a lot closer than we think it was. The Germans were having a lot harder time than we like to, to, to believe doing it. And finally, as I said, we have these over and over again premature Soviet counterattacks, which reinforce the Soviet, the, the, excuse me, the German prejudice that the Soviets are idiots. But in this case, it's just bad senior leadership, and the local commanders are learning at a very expensive price how to do things. When they finally do a deliberate offensive in November uh, at Operation Uranus, they are finally successful, and that pretty much sets the pattern for the rest of the war. Questions from the audience. Uh, could you please explain uh, what the exact uh, system was for training Soviet troops basically from the beginning of the war to the end of the war? Because there was this misconception that the Soviets were pretty much ill-trained, but from you know Operation Uranus on, that changes very greatly. So I'd just like to know a bit more about that. Um, it, it varies over time. I wish I could give you a straight answer. As I said, first of all, the Germans began, excuse me, the Soviets began the war with 13 million people who had been drafted and trained for at least six months between the wars. Uh, so right away they've got a basis to operate on. There is also a system that later becomes standardized where in the Soviet public schools they teach everybody the basics, how to read a map, how to fire a rifle, how to put on a protective mask, things like that. So they don't have to worry about that and so they can send them straight to troop units. They have an elaborate system as any army does of training sergeants and officers but they have a tendency in desperation to empty out those officer schools and use them as troops. Uh, and as the war progresses, not at this stage, but if you go forward starting a year later, you find that the, German, the Soviets are running short of troops, and what they basically do is go through and sweep up anyone that they can find and throw them in the ranks. So the training varies a great deal, from pretty well trained to you know, just shut up and get on the truck kind of attitude. Uh, but the same is true of the Germans. We tend to think of the Germans as highly trained. Uh, that's only true through about 41. From then on, they're, they're pretty much training people at the last minute. As soon as somebody turns 17 or 18, they run them through three months of training and ship them off to the front. So I don't know that the Soviets are really that much worse trained. That's a very rambling answer, but I, you, I think you see I, there isn't a simple answer to that. Was there any better way for the Germans to protect their left flank than to go and fight a building by building battle in Stalingrad? Mm -hmm. Very good point. I think that uh, it's always, to, it's, as an historian, I have 20 20 hindsight. Uh, but to, to answer your question, I think you're, you're implied in that is. If they had stayed out of Stalingrad, they would have been a lot better off. And I'm inclined to agree with you about that. That, as I said, they became sort of suckered into the mystique of let's take the city. And all they did was get bled to death. And their rate of advance fell from 20 kilometers a day to two blocks a day. So, yeah, I think that probably would have been, I'm not sure they would have won, but surely it would have helped better. What kind of tank production did the Soviets get out of the tank factory in the Stalingrad? Um, initially, they got a pretty good... Uh, production. There, there was actually a, I think a T-34 factory uh, in, North, in northern Stalingrad. And there are accounts in August of tanks that have not even been painted yet rolling off the front line and going to the front. But that ha stops pretty quickly. Um, if only because they can't get the raw materials into the city. And very quickly they have to call up the factory workers and use them as militia. So I, I don't know that anybody has any accurate figures, but I'd surprise if they got anything after August, if that answers the question. Doctor, can you sp uh, speak a little bit to the purges of the 30s, because that also decimated the officer corps for the Russians as he started in 40. That's very much the case. Uh, one of the reasons why the, German, the Soviet leadership in the military is much less experienced than the uh, the German experiences, uh, Germans are, is because of that very purge. Now, there's controversy about this. Some people have, have written a book saying it's all exaggerated, but it's been the generally accepted opinion is that about 60% of the professional officers 
in the entire uh, Soviet army were at one time or another arrested. That doesn't mean they were all killed. I showed you that picture. I don't know if I can get back to it here. Konstantin Rokossovsky is an example. Rokossovsky was uh, in 1937 implicated by somebody, I think it was being a case of somebody being tortured, so they frantically just spit out anything they could think of. He was arrested, refused to admit that he was guilty. Never was sent to Siberia. He spent three years being beat up in the prison, so he lost all his teeth. In 1940, the, German, the Soviets realized they need him to fight the Germans, took him out of prison, stopped long enough to give him a set of steel teeth, sort of like Jaws in the James Bond movies, and sent him to the front, where he started the war as a division commander and ended it as probably the third ranking Soviet com commander. Okay, So yeah, there, the purges obviously hurt them, but we have this misconception that everybody was killed. Lots of guys like Rokossovsky were recycled, so to speak. In all of this, with the Russians learning as, as they go along, how important was it uh, that, they, that uh, they were being fed intelligence from the Enigma machines? Being the question, if, if you can't hear, is the, uh, the, the influence of Enigma. We, we, the British, more than the Americans, were giving them, at least selectively, products of Enigma. Uh, and so they had some understanding of it. But then you run into the problem that, uh, and those of you who have ever done intelligence know this, rarely indeed you get one message that says, I'm going to invade Poland tomorrow at 3 o'clock, Heil me, sign Hitler. You know, you, don't, you don't get those messages. What you get are little bits and pieces that you try to put together in a picture. And that is subject to interpretation. As, and as an intel puke who has been ignored by political, uh, political leaders, I can tell you that uh, they're going to interpret things their way. That was certainly true in the warnings leading up to, to the German attack. It's probably true even here. There is an uneasy relationship, and there have been a number of books written about this, about we, we tried to give them information. In some cases, the British inserted Soviet-trained agents into Western Europe at the Soviet request, but the, you're right, that the, they didn't get nearly as what you would think they should have out of their intelligence cooperation. How much uh, did the Allies supply uh, the Russians? Yeah, the question is how much did the Allies supply the, Rus the Russians? An enormous amount, which of course in Soviet mythology was downplayed. Uh, they don't want to admit how much was done. I mentioned Second Guard's Army, for example. Second Guard's Army was equipped almost entirely with British Lend-Lease tanks. Um, the, British, the Soviets did not like Lend-Lease tanks very much, but they loved Lend-Lease uh, uniforms, something like 34 million uniforms given to the Red Army and 17 million pairs of boots. Um, and uh, literally tons for the local color of spam. Okay, One historian remarked that the, uh, the Allies won World War II with Russian blood and paid for it in spam. But, <laughs> but uh, they, they gave them a lot of raw materials and a lot of supplies. The only, uh, the only, as far as I know, the only request that was disapproved was in 1943, the Soviet Union asked for four tons of pitch blend. Anybody know which pitch blend is? You remember your Marie Curie? Right. What is it? Uranium ore. Uranium ore. Why do you suppose they need... Uranium ore in 1943. Yeah, they tried to tell us it was for luminous uh, compass dials. <laughs> Wrong answer. But as far as I know, that's the only one we disapproved. Seriously. So yeah, I mean, we prior to the Nordisk thing, I still think the Red Army would have won, but it'd probably take another year or two without Allied aid. How significant were the Soviet partisan attacks behind the lines? Um, they were just becoming really effective. Uh, and a part of this was that the, uh, just as the Stavka wanted to centrally control what was going on at the front, they also wanted to centrally control the partisans. And so they were parachuting a lot of, in many cases, female telegraph operators with portable uh, radio telegraphs in to the rear to try and link up with the partisans so they could get better control. Eventually, by 43, in the next major offensive, you find they have a very carefully organized system that gives them not only intelligence, but organized systematic sabotage. You know, blow up all the bridges on this railroad on this night kind of thing. But I think it's only just filtering in. It's not really fully effective in 42, if that's what you're asking. Germans had to administer all the land that they had conquered as mm -hmm. they moved into Russia. 
and I'm sure that took some effort. And you mentioned uh, three million prisoners that uh, I assume not all of them were killed. Uh, no, uh, but a lot of them, they just literally starved to death. The Germans did not do very much to take care of them. I hate to say it, but... Uh, well, I was just wondering how much of a drag this was on the German. It's a good point that the Germans, in fact, they have something called the general direction, uh, general administration that's supposed to administer the rear areas. Uh, the problem is that the troops going through, in some cases, have wrecked everything in front of them, either the Soviets withdrawing or the Germans pursuing them. There's one case up by um, near Leningrad that somebody has documented where the general administration comes in to administer what's left of the Soviet population, and they find that they, the uh, troops have left them so little food, they actually have to import food from Germany to feed the Soviets, which is exactly the opposite of what they planned to do, right? So yeah, they have an administrative problem. They also have, to come to the previous point, each of the army groups starts out with three low priority divisions for rear area security, with older troops and, and limited weapons and vehicles and so on and so forth. So they do have something in the way to do this. And I mentioned that the other, the Axis troops pull out. About the only thing the Axis troops other than the Romanians do in the war after 42 is they do some partisan fighting and helping the rear area. But there, you're absolutely right. There's a very thin crust of German administrators. In many cases, they're simply putting Soviet citizens into positions and sometimes handing them weapons to be guards and things like this. By one calculation, I don't entirely buy it, a million Soviet citizens served in uniform for the Germans. What role did Richard Sorge play, the uh, Japanese spy? Yeah, um, Richard Sorge, of course, is the one who supposedly, through the Japanese, learned of the, the impending attack. Um, the short answer is the, um, the Soviet leadership didn't believe him because Stalin didn't believe anybody. I have to be skeptical. I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I don't think the, so the, German, the Germans and the Japanese did not cooperate very much, so I don't know how much detail Sorge in Japan could have got about what the German plans were. Just to give you an example, Hitler did not know the, the uh, Japanese were going to attack at Pearl Harbor. So I don't know how much information you could have got through the back door that way. But didn't he say that... The uh, Japanese are not going to attack Russia. Uh, okay, that part you are correct. That he is one of the sources on which the. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm mis sorry. I misunderstood you. He, uh, Sorge is one of the sources on which the um, Soviets conclude that they can withdraw some of their troops from the east. Now they didn't denude the, the, the east. What they did is create new formations of reservists and leave them there, and then take the more competent, better trained units and ship them west. On the, on the uh, railroad, but uh, so yeah, to some extent that helped them. But uh, I, again, I'm not sure whether we can put too much um, stress or emphasis on the actions of one person. Regarding the T-34, I heard that some of them were only radio equipped. Um, that's true. Originally, uh, first of all, there's two models of T-34, two basic models with constant little changes. Uh, the T-34 76, 76 millimeter gun is what we're talking about here. Um, the pre-war ones, the, the Soviets did not see a need to put radios in all of their tanks, and that had been true. And they, they were not the only ones like this. Uh, only the British Army initially really understood that every tank has to have a two-way radio. Okay, it took a while for people to understand that effective maneuver requires two-way communications for these guys. So yeah, there were undoubtedly some tanks, but the standard crew of a T-34, as I recall, was five men because it included the radio operator. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the way it is. Regarding the T-34, did, did, that have, did that have American suspension with it? And then how did they design that? Did the Russians take like the best designs from different? The Russians bought the copyright, or, or the, yeah, should we call it copyright? Uh, the patent, excuse me, uh, from Christie that he had tried to sell to the Americans. And they incorporated some aspects of that in a lot of their tank design. And uh, not so much the T-34, I think, as the earlier ones, the BT-7s and so on. But the other thing the Russians did is, quite openly, they contracted with Ford Motor Company to come to uh, Russia. This is in between the wars and lay out their, fa their factories for best mass production. Because, the, of course, the, Russia, the Ford Motor Company invented the assembly line for vehicles. 
And so they got a lot of technical help, which they paid for from the U.S. to, to, to produce all kinds of vehicles, including T-34s. Uh, the homework assignment for all of you is to spend the rest of the week in your backyard. Yeah. Get in touch with the Russian front. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much yeah. for coming. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.